A House panel Monday looked into the Pentagon's Joint Strike Fighter program, its funding and cooperation from other countries. Connecticut Representative Christopher Shays chairs this two-hour, 25-minute hearing. Good morning. Yes. A quorum being present, the Subcommittee on National Security, Emerging Threats, and International Relations hearing entitled as DOD Meeting Joint Strike Fighter JSF International Cooperative Program Goals is called to order. The Joint Strike Fighter, or JSF, could be a model for 21st century weapon system acquisition, promising three planes in one jointness, low risk development strategies, and unprecedented international participation or it could fall prey to the same cost growth schedule delays and inter-service disputes that plagued so many Cold War procurements. In previous hearings on the JSF programs, we examined efforts to implement a knowledge-based development cycle, allowing technology maturity and design stability, not external funding deadlines, to drive the program forward. Today we ask whether international participation and technology sharing are being managed so as to maximize benefits and minimize risk to the Department of Defense's largest cooperation program. At our request, the General Accounting Office, GAO, examined the complex set of relationships between the JSF program and its eight international partners. They assessed how DOD measures expected cost-sharing benefits, manages foreign partner expectations, and mitigates the risks of significant technology transfers. Their report, which has been released, finds the JSF program in need of stronger management and oversight because international participants currently have no requirement or incentive to share in cost growth. JAO also found the Department of Defense has insufficient knowledge about contractor activities to anticipate and mitigate risks associated with technology transfers. The countries that are currently our eight international partners are the United Kingdom, which is a full collaborative level one partner, Italy and the Netherlands are level two partners. Turkey, Norway, Australia, Canada, and Denmark are level three partners. In meeting our national and global security obligations, collaborative programs with allies offer the potential for common doctrine, shared training, and far greater operational integration in combat. That level of collaboration also demands greater access to sensitive defense technologies than we are accustomed. It also may demand technology transfers at a pace and volume our current laws, regulations, and management systems cannot yet handle safely. Others in the Department of Defense and Defense Ministries and other nations are watching the JSF for signs that collaboration is worth emulating in other programs. For the Joint Strike Fighter to fly is the new standard for efficient, affordable, truly joint acquisition, management of international participation, and technology transfers must be improved. As Vice Chairman of this subcommittee, as well as a member of the Armed Services Committee, I'm very interested in the continuing monitoring of this program. Today, witnesses from GAO and the Department of Defense will discuss these important issues and efforts to strengthen management of the Joint Strike Fighter Program. We welcome them, and we look forward to their testimony. And we have with us today uh, Mr. Kucinich, who is the ranking member on this subcommittee, and Mr. Schrock, uh, who is also in attendance and a member of the committee. Uh, the individuals testifying for us today are Catherine Shinazi, Director, Acquisition and Sourcing Management, U.S. General Accounting Office. She's accompanied by Brian Mullins, who is the Senior Defense Analyst, Acquisition and Source Management, U.S. General Accounting Office. Mr. Al Volkman, Director, Acquisition Technology and Logistics, International Cooperation, Department of Defense. Ms. Susan Patrick, Deputy Undersecretary, Acquisition, Technology and Logistics, Industrial Policy, Department of Defense. 
and Major General John L. Hudson, Program Manager, Joint Strike Fighter, JSF Program, Department of Defense. <clears throat> Mr. Kucinich, would you have an opening statement? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for calling this hearing on the Joint Strike Fighter Program and welcome the witnesses to this hearing. I would like to raise two issues regarding this topic that I hope our witnesses can address. First is the issue of cost sharing. As we learned in earlier hearings on this program and the F-22, the increasing cost of aircraft development and production programs is one of the most reliable events in Washington. As we have seen over and over again, DOD is not capable of accurately predicting cost increases and its efforts to effectively control them are, frankly, lacking intent and competence. I believe any serious person examining DOD's track record would agree. For example, as we learned at our last hearing, F-22 production costs have increased by nearly $20 billion since 1996. And the number of planes the Pentagon can afford within the congressional cost cap for this program has plummeted to less than a third of their original goal. Today, the subcommittee will focus on the Joint Strike Fighter program. I look forward to the testimony of the U.S. General Accounting Office, which will release a new report on the implications of the International Cost Sharing Agreement of the JSF program. As the GAO report demonstrates, international involvement in the program has benefits and risks. On one hand, foreign governments will share at least some of the costs of the program. However, the GAO report concludes that this cost-sharing arrangement is by no means ideal. While the inclusion of international partners is intended to defray some costs, the GAO report finds that partner countries are not required to share any future program cost increases. As we know from our past experience, staggering cost increases are a guarantee in aircraft development programs for the JSF cost-sharing arrangement to allow foreign partners to be exempt from future cost increases seems to ignore reality and submit the American taxpayer to an unfair burden. Indeed, GAO concluded that if costs increase, which is a virtual certainty, quote, the burden may fall almost entirely on the United States, unquote. I hope our witnesses can address this concern. My second concern is that the Pentagon's current plan for developing and producing aircraft will do nothing to address the fundamental problem with our military's rapidly aging fleet. As the average age of our fleet continues to grow, maintenance costs will continue to soar, and the effectiveness of the U.S. military will decline. Buying only a few hundred expensive planes from the F-22 and JSF programs will not decrease the average age of our planes. To the contrary, under the Pentagon's current plan, the average age of U.S. aircraft will continue to grow. Mr. Chairman, these may seem like obvious problems, but I have yet to hear an obvious explanation or how the Pentagon intends to address them. And until I do, I cannot support the administration's current plan for aircraft development and or acquisition. So I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and once again, thank you for making this hearing possible. I ask for unanimous consent that all members of the subcommittee be permitted to place any opening statement in the record and that the record remain open for three days for that purpose. That objection, so ordered. I ask for the unanimous consent that all witnesses be permitted to include their, wit their written statements in the record and without objection, so ordered. <coughs> Turning then to the administration of the oath, if the uh, witnesses would stand.
do so and we raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Note for the record that the witness has responded in the affirmative. Thank you. During the testimony, uh, the lights that appear before you will mark off five-minute increments. Uh, each of you will have 10 minutes uh, for your presentation before the committee. Um, I'll begin uh, with uh, Catherine Shinazi. Uh, thank you. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I'm pleased to be here today to discuss the Joint Strike Fighter Program's international acquisition strategy. Um, with your permission, I'd like to summarize my statement and then, as you indicated, have the entire text put in the record. DOD views the Joint Strike Fighter Program as both a model for acquisition reform and as an example for the future of international cooperation. We have previously reported to the subcommittee on how the Joint Strike Fighter program is being managed relative to best practices for product development. Today, I would like to focus my remarks on the international structure of the Joint Strike Fighter program, the benefits and challenges cooperative development brings to the overall acquisition approach, and the opportunity DOD has to achieve pr critical program goals. As we found in our earlier assessments of how well the Joint Strike Fighter program is meeting its cost schedule and performance goals, we have again determined that one of the keys to lowering risks of managing the international participants in this program is having sufficient knowledge on which to base decisions. The Joint Strike Fighter program is structured on a multi-tiered set of relationships involving both government and industry from the United States and eight partner countries. And I've, um, we've prepared a chart that illustrates the significant relationships between the participants. At the top level, there is a framework MOU and supplemental memorandums of agreement between the Department of Defense and each of the partner countries' departments of defense that identify the roles, responsibilities, and expected benefits for all participants. And I'd be happy to answer questions about this chart as we go through the Q&A session. The current agreement covers only the system development and demonstration phase, which was begun with a contract award to Lockheed Martin, the prime contractor, in October 2001, and is scheduled to run about 10 years at an estimated cost of $33 billion. Additional agreements will need to be negotiated for the production phase of the Joint Strike Fighter Program. The U.S. and its foreign partners expect to realize a variety of benefits from cooperation on the Joint Strike Fighter Program. The U.S. expects to benefit from partner contributions and potential future aircraft sales through access to industrial capabilities in partner countries and through improved interoperability with allies once the aircraft is fielded. Partner governments expect to obtain an aircraft that they could not afford to develop on their own and to benefit from increased access to Joint Strike Fighter program data and technology transferred from U.S. aerospace companies to their national industries. Because of the significant expectations partners have regarding government and industry return, the Joint Strike Fighter Program Office and Lockheed Martin face significant challenges in balancing these expectations against other program goals. Achieving program goals for cost, schedule, and performance requires that subcontracts be awarded to companies who can deliver quality products on time and at cost. In addition, the Program Office and DOD must balance the need to transfer sufficient technology to foreign companies to perform successfully in a timely fashion, while adhering to the broader U.S. disclosure and export control safeguards. Although the Program Office and Lockheed Martin have anticipated some of these challenges and are developing plans to address them, some decisions have already been taken that depart from early goals. Let me briefly address these. First, industrial participation. As the prime contractor, Lockheed Martin makes the key subcontracting decisions and therefore bears the primary responsibility for managing partner expectations. The approach Lockheed Martin has put in place is referred to as best value. Best value is meant to differentiate this program from earlier cooperative ventures in which a share of work was guaranteed for a certain level, level of investment. Best value is meant to focus more heavily on the use of competition. Lockheed Martin performed assessments for many of the partners 
to determine the ability of their industries to compete for JSF contracts, and then signed agreements with some partner governments and suppliers to document the opportunities they would have to bid for JSF contracts, as well as the potential value of those contracts. Lockheed Martin has, has modified that concept a bit, um, and it has now adopted what they call a strategic best value sourcing plan which appears to modify the original best value approach by allowing work packages to be directly awarded to industry in partner countries where contract awards to date have not met partner expectations. While there are predetermined cost goals under these strategic awards, there, is, there are concerns that this represents a departure from the competitive approach. The second set of expectations in the Str Joint Strike Fighter Program relates to technology. The United States has committed to design, develop, and qualify aircraft for the partners that are as common to the U.S. Joint Strike Fighter configuration as possible within national disclosure policy boundaries. DOD, the Joint Strike Fighter Program Office, and Lockheed Martin have taken a number of steps to anticipate and solve problems associated with technology transfers, including requests for exceptions from the national disclosure policy. However, partners continue to express concern about the pace of information sharing and decision making, particularly relating to the Joint Strike Fighter support concept. In addition to timely and favorable disclosure decisions, the Joint Strike Fighter contractors must receive authorization to transfer data and technology through the export licensing process. Export authorizations for critical suppliers need to have timely planning, preparation, and disposition to help avoid schedule delays and cost increases. Without proper planning, there could be pressure to expedite reviews and approvals to support program schedules. Planning could also help identify alternative sources for critical contracts to prevent problems in the event that technology transfer approvals are disallowed. Lockheed Martin has already added resources to address the volume of authorizations, but it has not yet completed a required long-term industrial participation plan that could help identify mitigation strategies. Finally, let me touch briefly on the impact of technical issues in the program. At its recent preliminary design review, the Joint Strike Fighter program uncovered problems with regard to aircraft weight, design maturity, and weapons integration. These problems, with their resulting cost increases, are common in DOD programs. However, partners have less control over program decisions that both cause and result from a lack of knowledge, while the impact may be more substantial as they cannot as easily adjust to these changes. In summary, the Joint Strike Fighter program is not immune to problems that have, have historically plagued DOD systems <coughs> acquisitions. International participation in the program, while providing benefits, makes managing these challenges more difficult and places additional risk on DOD and the prime contractor. Because Lockheed Martin bears the responsibility for managing partner industrial expectations, it will be forced to balance its ability to meet partner expectations, which could be key to securing future sales and profitability against program milestones and the company's ability to collect award fees. In turn, DOD must be prepared to balance risks resulting from contractor decisions against the national obligations set forth in agreements with partner governments and the need to protect some of the most sensitive U.S. military technology. While some steps have been taken to position the JSF program for success, Given its size and importance, additional attention from DOD in the program office would help decrease the risks associated with implementing the international program. In the report we are releasing today to this subcommittee, we recommend that DOD ensure that the JSF program office and its prime contractors have sufficient information on international supplier planning to fully anticipate and mitigate the risks associated with technology transfer, and that information concerning the selection and management of suppliers is available, closely monitored, and used to improve program outcomes. Toward this end, DOD and the Joint Strike Fighter Program Office need to maintain a significant knowledge base to enable adequate oversight and control. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my summary, and I would be happy to take your questions. Thank you very much. Mr. Volkman. Mr. Chairman, members of the panel, 
uh, thank you for this opportunity to share my views regarding the Joint Strike Fighter Program. The Joint F Strike Fighter Program is a new benchmark for cooperative research, development, and production between the Department of Defense and our allies. DOD concurs with the GAO report, agrees with the report's recommendations, and will work closely with the Joint Strike Fighter Program Office, our partner nations, and JSF contractors to achieve effective program oversight. The core objectives of armaments cooperation for programs like JSF are to increase military effectiveness through standardization and interoperability, and to reduce weapons acquisition costs by avoiding duplication of development efforts with our allies. The U.S. will benefit from sharing JSF program costs, improving interoperability with key allies, gaining access to selected foreign industrial capabilities, and increasing international sales potential. Our Joint Strike Fighter partners will benefit from cooperatively developing and acquiring an affordable next generation strike fighter weapons capability, participating in the day-to-day -day management of the program, and building long-term industrial relationships with U.S. aerospace companies. The JSF International Program structure is based on a complex set of relationships involving both government and industry from the U.S. and our eight partner nations. Foreign and domestic suppliers compete for JSF work under a best value approach implemented through the three prime contractors, Lockheed Martin, Pratt & Whitney, and General Electric. The benefits obtained through the JSF International Program are substantial. However, DOD recognizes that successfully implementing JSF cooperation will be challenging. Three challenges are mentioned in the GAO report possible future program cost increases. The JSF program director has and will continue to use various program management tools, frequent partner meetings and discussions, and contract incentives to keep the system development and demonstration effort under the cost ceiling of $33.23 billion. DOD's experience indicates that international cooperative system development programs such as JSF have usually been successful in equitably sharing proposed cost ceiling increases if DOD is able to make a good case to Congress and the partners that the additional funds provided will result in the fielding of a needed defense capability. Technology transfer. DOD is using available NATO exemptions in expediting and pre-coordinating reviews of individual export licenses to ensure timely, comprehensive JSF export authorizations take place. Additionally, in October 2002, the Department of State approved Lockheed Martin's Global Project Authorization request to accelerate export approvals for non-sensitive, unclassified technical data associated with JSF subcontracting activities. None of our export control mechanisms have been compromised but rather have been streamlined and transformed into a more workable process that all JSF stakeholders have agreed to follow. Participant return on, ex on investment expectations. If partner industrial participation expectations conflict with program cost, schedule, and performance goals, the JSF program director and the Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition Technology and Logistics, in concert with prime contractors, will employ their best efforts to identify, assess, and resolve partner in industrial participation issues. DOD's leadership is fully committed to ensuring the success of the Joint Strike Fighter. The Joint Strike Fighter is DOD's largest international cooperative program by any measure and has the full support of the Secretary of Defense and my boss, Mike Wynn, our Acting Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition Technology and Logistics. Mr. Wynn, Ms. Patrick, and I will continue to work closely with Major General Hudson and his program team, as well as other key U.S. government stakeholders, to ensure that the GAO's recommendations are implemented and that the program meets or exceeds DOD and partner objectives. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Volkman. I want to acknowledge that our, our chairman, uh, Chris Chase, has joined us. And, uh, 
we'll uh, then move on to uh, Ms. Patrick. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to share with you my assessment of international industrial participation in the JSF program, as well as my thoughts on the importance of this program for the global defense industrial base and coalition warfare. As you highlighted in your letter ask, in asking us to testify, Mr. Chairman, the Joint Strike Fighter program was conceived as an international cooperative development and acquisition program in order to attract financial investment to share the cost burden to enhance interoperability with allies, to leverage technological innovation from partner countries, and to promote the eventual foreign sales of the aircraft. With affordability as a linchpin of the program, it was critical at the outset to take extraordinary and unprecedented measures to control costs. This program's international contracting strategy is a fundamental departure from offsets. It's best value sourcing strategy where foreign companies have to compete their way onto the program on an equal basis with U.S. companies has in fact elicited complaints by foreign governments and defense firms. That said, we believe that this program is, appro is providing appropriate access and great potential to partner countries. The JSF international acquisition strategy is unprecedented in the program investment it was able to attract from partner countries and companies in the case of Denmark and in the opportunity it presents for partner companies to participate in the global industrial base supporting a state-of-the-art, cost-effective, and well-funded program. This program provides the opportunity for participating companies to produce components of JSF not only for their own or consortia operational requirements, the F-16 model, but also near-term for the much larger United States and United Kingdom JSF inventories with the promise of content on all worldwide JSM inventories produced well into the first half of the century. Our assessment of the impact of the JSF program on the partner countries and companies has made clear some of the challenges associated with its revolutionary international acquisition strategy. Partner countries that had early, active, and far-reaching government involvement in structuring an in-country industrial strategy for the JSF program have had the most success in gaining program content to date, Canada and the United Kingdom. The extent to which partner countries were committed to purchasing JSF for their own forces also made for better results. Countries committed to purchasing the aircraft for themselves have greater incentive in helping to market the aircraft elsewhere for reasons of investment recoupment, return levies from non-partner sales, and larger incremental revenues from their, for their participating companies. In addition, in the cases where a mix of JSF and Eurofighter aircraft are envisioned, countries with clear plans such as Italy were better able to referee industrial interest attached to the two platforms. Finally, in these countries, the government, the military services, and the industry were able to most effectively lobby their parliamentary bodies on behalf of the program. That said, the program is still bedeviled by the strategies of industrial interests that would be better served by purchases of the Eurofighter, which has made for something less than a level playing field for the JSF program. In discussions with partner countries and their companies, they complain that the single most important factor to de-level the playing field has been the lateness and ineffectiveness of the global project authorization. This had the greatest impact on those suppliers that did not have well-established re relationships pre-existing with U.S. primes and first-tier suppliers. Even Canada's statutory advantage of exemption from U.S. ITAR regulations did not eliminate their need for TAAs. Export control issues have indeed plagued virtually all of the JSF international partners, but in no case have these issues caused program schedule delays or cost increases. However, I hasten to point out that some of the strategies used by partner countries and companies in their approaches to JSF indicate that their strategies are no less revolutionary. The Netherlands identified the JSF program as one of two pillars on which it expects to build a world-class aerospace industry. Danish industry was so impressed with the opportunities the program affords that it invested in systems development and demonstration phase along with the Danish government. Canada Canada provides prize quality and business certifications to JSF contractors, and Canadian company bids on program opportunities will surpass 100 in its first year or so as an SDD partner. 
Major Italian companies are sending about 100 of their engineers to be part of six Lockheed integrated product teams in Dallas-Fort Worth and El Segundo. The Danish firm Systematic has sta stationed several of its engineers at Lockheed to demonstrate their expertise. JSF Canada surveyed the U.S. JSF industrial base visiting the primes as well as second and third tier suppliers. The U.K. Department of Trade and Industry surveyed its own potential supplier base early in the program, as did Australia's JSF Industry Advisory Council. In addition, Australia established integrated capability teams to parallel Lockheed's IPTs for maximum program connectivity. To, see it, to oversee industrial participation in the program, the United Kingdom, Canada, and the Netherlands established JSF organizations in their countries. Many partner countries have also sponsored or co-sponsored JSF Industry Days for their suppliers. The massive return potential to partner countries and coalition warfighters from the program is already apparent. Surely a time traveler to 2030 would report back to present government and corporate decision makers their successors' disbelief that the international opportunities from the JSF program were not clearly seen early in the program's history. We also believe that some of the JSF program's most important disciples will be other U.S. program managers who refine their international acquisition strategies based on the JSF program's early lesson learned. Evidence already abounds that the program is reshaping the global defense industrial base. UK industry is undoubtedly already reaping benefits from the substantive role they had in some of the most challenging aspects of the JSF development. Countries that chose to fund and focus discretionary R&D investments on the program and have done well speak volumes about the importance of R&D investment for innovation and competitiveness. Transnational links are already being forged among the partner countries and their companies, which will yield untold international defense industrial alliances, market access, and technology spinoffs. Finally, the program will dramatically increase the scale of many small and mid-sized companies in the global defense industrial base. Above all, however, it is imperative to remember the promise and importance of the JSF program to the American, British, and other partner country warfighters. If we stay the course with minor rudder adjustments, JSF will provide great benefits to the U.S. and global defense industrial base and warfighters alike. Not to do so would undermine U.S. credibility in the global marketplace and among our most important friends and allies. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Patrick. Major General John L. Hudson. General. Mr. Chairman and other distinguished members of the panel, I'd like to thank you for inviting me here today to share with you my views on the international aspects of the Joint Strike Fighter Program. I'll give you a brief summary of my uh, statement, which will be entered into the record. Joint Strike Fighter will field affordably a weapon system for the United States and our allied warfighters that will be highly interoperable and enhance our future ability to conduct coalition warfare in a highly effective manner. The Joint Strike Fighter Program has been international since the concept demonstration phase of the program. As we entered the current system development and demonstration phase of the program in October of 2001, by awarding of contracts to Lockheed and Pratt and & Whitney and the ongoing General Electric program, we have continued that relationship with our close allies. International cooperation has brought foreign investment to the program, which has saved U.S. taxpayers approximately $4.5 billion. The international strategy we employed for the Joint Strike Fighter Program was vetted by the executive branch of our government and coordinated with the Congress. We had, as a result, a coordinated effort for the system development and demonstration phase, which we are currently in. We have eight cooperative partners on board, which include the United Kingdom, Italy, the Netherlands, Turkey, Australia, Canada, Denmark, and Norway. These countries have invested their scarce R&D resources into our program. We broke the old traditional paradigm, and instead of offsets, we are using a best value approach. So the weapon system will truly be affordable to develop, procure, own, and operate. Integrating our partners is indeed challenging. It started out to be and will continue to be a win-win proposition for both sides. Although complex, I can assure you that we have found a proper balance between the benefits that our partners derive from the program and the benefits that we incur as a result of the relationship. We are in full compliance with national disclosure policy, 
and have arrangements in place that protect sensitive U.S. technology while at the same time allowing prudent, prudent levels of technology transfer to occur. The Global Project Authorization is in place. This allows a streamlined approval process for unclassified, non-sensitive technology transfer. Department of Defense and Department of State still fully focus on requests for transfer of sensitive, unclassified, and classified information through the TAA process. Technology transfer is a two-way street, and we, the U.S., have been the beneficiaries of this transfer by affording our companies the opportunity to seek innovative and affordable technologies anywhere in the world. We are working within the global marketplace, and it has paid dividends for us. An example of this reverse technology transfer is the technology that our UK partner industries have brought to the table in the form of short takeoff, short takeoff and vertical landing expertise and know-how. Unlike most past cooperative development programs, the Joint Strike Fighter Program Director makes all final decisions on the program. The program director consults with partner countries and ensures they have good situational awareness of the program environment and appropriate decision processes. The international agreements provide a good balance of responsibilities and obligations. A key enabler of affordability is the high commonality designed into the Joint Strike Fighter weapon system between the conventional takeoff and landing, short takeoff and vertical landing, and carrier variants. Another key enabler of affordability is the active, ongoing process to use cost as an independent variable or CAVE as a means to control costs. A third is our well-founded requirements document and a joint configuration steering board within DOD which manages and controls Joint Strike Fighter requirements. In summary, I would like to say that we are currently meeting our international commitments utilizing a well-structured international strategy that have that has found a proper balance between national disclosure policy, affordability, interoperability, and transformation for future coalition warfare. We have a good understanding of the risks associated with technology transfer, and we have risk mitigation plans in place. We have implemented security agreements with our partners on a government-to-government -government basis, and we are in full compliance with national disclosure policy. We have a full-time export compliance officer as well. It is a complex arrangement, but our partnership is working and benefiting the collective group. I look forward to your questions and your continued support of this superb weapon system. General, thank you very much. Uh, we'll now proceed with a five-minute round of, of questions, and we'll go first to Mr. Schrock, who, in addition to being a member of this subcommittee on national security, is also a member of the Armed Services Committee. Mr. Schrock. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in the Joint Strike Fighter because I believe the finished product will no doubt be cited in the district that I'm privileged to represent. And I know nothing about airplanes except when I get on them, I fasten my seatbelt and get off at the end. But I was privileged to sit in the simulator over in Crystal City, and I think even an idiot like me who knows nothing about flying could fly that thing in a while. It's an absolutely amazing machine. I, re I read some of the uh, information that was sent to us before we came in here, and on page five of one of the statements, it said, U.S. policymakers have become increasingly interested in pursuing acquisition and procurement programs with allies. Help me understand that. I'm, I'm guessing some of the parts that are going to go into the Joint Strike Fighter can only be produced in a certain country, and they aren't produced here. Why can't, uh, I'm not trying to be isolationist, but why can't producers in our country provide all the parts and systems that are going to be needed in this new aircraft. I get that be for the DOD folks. We're, uh, we're interested in cooperating with our allies uh, because one of the, the benefits of uh, cooperation with allies is that uh, we acquire the same equipment. And uh, we expect that uh, in the future that we will be operating in conflicts around the world with allies, right. with our closest allies. And uh, by acquiring, by cooperating together, of course, a major advantage of that is that we have uh, interoperability with our allies by result of having the same equipment. Uh, certainly another uh, factor that goes into our desire to cooperate in the development and production of equipment with allies is the fact that, in fact, we would like our allies to have a high military capability uh, one of the things that came out of President Bush's uh, NATO summit last November 
was an agreement on the part of allies at, to engage in something called the Prague Capabilities Commitment, which essentially is a commitment on the part of our allies to try to increase, our European allies, to try to increase their military capability. And uh, clearly, if programs like the Joint Strike Fighter uh, will contribute to a very high level of military capability uh, um, with our allies. And, and as I said, the interoperability of the equipment is important. And uh, I could go on, but uh, okay. just to briefly finish, uh, clearly the, the fact that our allies contribute to the uh, cost of an expensive development program uh, it was, has been recognized by the General Accounting Office as a major benefit okay. of the Joint Strike Fighter program. And the technology that comes from our allies is, is very important. The, as, as General Hudson said in his statement, much of the vertical takeoff and landing technology that will be used for that aspect of the Joint Strike Fighter program, in fact, originated in the United Kingdom and still resides there. So these are all reasons why we believe it's important to have cooperative programs with our allies. And I completely agree with that. Um, and I, I agree with the cost sharing, but I think Mr. Kucinich mentioned some of the cost overruns. And I was, as I read some of the uh, information here, and correct me if I'm wrong, if there are cost overruns, the United States is the one, the United States company is the one who bears the burden of that cost increase. Is that true? And how do we assure ourselves that technology, we're not going to be transferring technology that we don't want some bad guy to get somewhere because our friend today could be our enemy tomorrow. How do we, how do we balance that to, to make sure that doesn't happen? The cost overruns concerns me too. Why aren't the other countries and those companies sharing in the burden of that as well? I think I'd like uh, General Hudson to share sure. in my answer, but I'll, I'll just answer briefly by saying that uh, it, cost overruns uh, will make a decision. We'll try to avoid cost overruns. The cost overruns would, would not be borne by the contractors who are participating in the program, so far as I know, uh, but would be the governments would have to decide whether to fund those cost overruns. We would try to minimize the opportunity for a cost overrun. We clearly, if we had to fund an overrun or thought it was the right thing to do, would have to come to the Congress. To, the Congress would have to approve the funding of the overrun for the U.S. share. And then, of course, we would consult with our allies uh, and, uh, and come to some determination as to whether they would fund uh, their share of the, of the cost overrun, just as the U.S. will have to make a decision as to whether to, to, share, to fund a share of the cost overrun. We are being technology transfer, uh, we are being extremely uh, thorough in working with the Department of State, who uh, has, uh, in most cases, the final say in what technologies are transferred. So we've gone through a very deliberative process in deciding which technology should be transferred, and, and we will in the future. But may, I, may I suggest, may I answer me if I'm uh, correct or wrong on this one? I'm guessing the overruns are created because from the time somebody has the concept, the thought in their brain about the Joint Strike Fighter, the time it lands at a base somewhere is many, 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 many years. Because of all the, trans the technology increases uh, that occur, why put an old piece of technology in something that's going to be uh, uh, flying in you know, ten, 8 or 9 or ten, 11 years? And isn't that the reason for a lot of those c cost overruns? Yes, sir. If I may, I'd like to follow up uh, Mr. Volkman's uh, answer. Sure. Um, in terms of the uh, development cost, uh, what the GAO reported about is accurate. The partner countries are not obliged to share with us any potential future cost overruns. However, we have the option to go to them, DOD can go to them and ask for their sharing in this. Um, it is... Um, Why would they do that? Why would they Well, it would be to? their benefit, sir, to ensure that we indeed have an affordable, effective weapon system to be able to be deployed to the fleet. There are a couple of other things that uh, we bring to the table here to help control costs. One of them is uh, the application of costs as an independent variable. For example, if we are going through the development program and we see that we can meet 90 percent of one of our 430 specification points with a certain amount of cost and that less 10 percent is really expensive, we would look at the operational analysis there and maybe we wouldn't go for that last 10 percent and that helps us avoid uh, excessive uh, cost on the program. Oh, the other is we have a joint and international um, configuration steering board that meets uh, several times each year. 
We look at uh, evolving requirements and study their potential cost impact on the program. That gives us a very disciplined and rigorous method to control requirements on a program and we ensure that we're doing the right thing in terms of transmitting those requirements to our prime contractors. I would also like to mention that both Lockheed and Pratt & Whitney and General Electric conducted market surveys of capabilities that exist in other countries in order to figure out where the world-class capabilities are that exist in co companies outside the United States. Uh, for example, uh, the short takeoff and vertical, vertical landing technology that comes from the United Kingdom, the lift fan technology that powers the Marine Corps variant are examples of things that come to the table from companies in other countries. We find that there are indeed niche capabilities out there in other countries. I hold Lockheed, Pratt & Whitney, and General Electric accountable for their cost, schedule, and technical performance on the program, so it is to their advantage to indeed find the companies out there that help them provide the best value to the United States and our coalition allies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kucinich. Question to uh, Ms. Shinazi. In uh, JAO's opinion, is it uh, likely that costs will rise in the JSF program? Yes. And then based on JAO's past experience with this and other aircraft development and production programs, how good is the Pentagon's record at predicting and controlling cost increases? We have reported on many occasions that um, the Department continually underestimates the costs associated with its major systems acquisitions. How much are we talking about in terms of increased costs over the long run? Billions of dollars? I, I cannot Ms. predict Nosey, that. At could, could you please come closer point. to the microphone? Is that Move your mic closer. I believe it's closed, sir. No, move it closer to you so they can hear. Okay. We're looking for proximity. Right. <laughs> In terms of the order of magnitude, I, I, can't, um, I can't address that on this program. There have been some things done um, for cost control purposes on the Joint Strike Fighter program that we have not seen in other programs. At the same time, however, um, in a report that we issued to this subcommittee in October of 2001, I believe, we recommended that the program not go forward into its current phase because a number of the critical technologies needed to get not just the performance but the costs, meet the cost estimates, were not mature. Now, uh, recognizing the virtual certainty of cost increases. Why did the Defense Department negotiate cost-sharing agreements that ignored these realities? Um, that question may be better addressed to, to the DOD well, witnesses. Well, then let me, let me ask answer, the Defense Department then. I, that's, uh, I'll ask him. Uh, General but, Hudson, uh, would you like to respond? Do you agree with GAO's finding that foreign partners are currently not required to submit additional funding when costs increase for the program? Yes, sir, I agree. They are not required to do that. So what's the Department's justification for completely exempting foreign partners from sharing in these increased costs, and what's the rationale for giving them this wholesale exemption? Well, sir, the, they, they actually are not exempt from it. They, while they do not have to provide additional funds, if we were to ask them, they have the same uh, interest in providing an effective and affordable system to their warfighters. And depending on what the nature of the cost issue is, uh, it might be uh, greatly in their benefit to help us share the costs well, for the capability it, in the airplane. It, it, well, it seems that uh, we have a condition here where U.S. taxpayers might, may be sharing a disproportionate cost burden. Now, uh, Mr. Nazi, DOD claims it can manage costs and therefore alleviate the need to ask partner countries for additional funds by using a variety of tools. These include, include program management tools, frequent partner meetings and discussions, and contract incentives. Do you believe these measures will guarantee that costs will not increase? We have found consistently that when programs move forward on a schedule-driven basis rather than a knowledge-driven basis, that the risk mitigation and other plans that are always in place on these programs are not sufficient to control costs. That, that was very well put. Um, now, with um, 
foreign countries contributing to the program, uh, do they require offsets, Ms. Shinazi? This can be seen as another type of offset, actually, this program. Um, Jobs, technology transfer? Yes. And we have seen trends in the offset arrangements um, that defense companies enter into um, expand over time to include many of the same kinds of arrangements that we will see in these cooperative programs. You know, Mr. Chairman uh, and, uh, and Mr. Shays, I think it would be useful for this committee to be able to uh, probe ever more deeply into this issue of offsets because uh, it may be that the peculiarities of the structure of this system uh, result in loss of jobs in our country. And as we transfer technology, it then enables uh, manufacturers uh, like Lockheed Martin to push forward with the development of even newer models to be able to be uh, more competitive with the models that they just transferred to other countries. And I, I think it would be useful to be able to see if we are not uh, setting in place here a system which guarantees ever escalating expenditures for uh, ever evolving technologies. I thank the Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Our Chairman, Chairman Chase. Thank you. Um, nice to be here, and I appreciate um, uh, that we are discussing what I think is a very important, obviously a very important issue for our country. I, I was told when I was first elected 16 years ago that the decisions I make uh, for the Defense Department won't show up for 10 years. And so, as well as I thought about how we had conducted the first Gulf War and all the equipment that we had and so on, uh, I, I mentally gave credit to those who voted in 1980, not, not 1990. Having said that, I, I want to just understand a few things, and, and I, I realize some of this is going to be a, a, a little, um, uh, you, you've already said it, but I'm not quite sure uh, what we're saying here. Um, first off, it's my understanding we have the Joint Strike Fighter, the Air Force uh, F-22 Raptor, and the Navy F-A-18EF Super Hornet. Those are the, the planes that we're going to develop in the future. And that when we're talking about the Joint Strike Fighter, we're looking um, in, in current dollars uh, at a cost of $1.197 trillion. Is that a, an accurate cost? Um, sir, I would uh, have to take that one for the record. I don't know where that uh, figure comes from. What is the cost of the uh, Joint Strike Fighter going to be when we do our 200,457 aircraft? Sir, in today's dollars, uh, what we submitted to Congress with the most recent select acquisition report, which came in at the start of this year, was it's in the high 30s for the High 30 million per copy. That's an average unit recurring flyaway cost for the conventional takeoff and landing variant. And it's between the high 40 and low $50 million per copy figure for the short takeoff and vertical landing variant. Isn't that based on $94? On, that's today's dollars, sir. It's actually $02. It's $02. So do, do the ad for me. What, how many planes are we ordering and what is it going to cost us? Sir, those averages are based on uh, 2593, 2,593, which is 1,763 for the U.S. Air Force, 150 for the United Kingdom, and the balance for the U.S. Uh, Navy and the U.S. Marine Corps. The final split between the short takeoff and vertical landing variant, the carrier variant. You're telling me a little long, more than what? I, I'm just going to start basic, and then we're going to go out with the details. What is this program going to cost? How many planes are we going to order? And what is this program going to cost in today's dollars? The number of planes that the U.S. currently intends to order is 2,443. And what is it going to cost? It's in the high 30s. It's about... No, I don't want to know per plane. What is this program going to cost us? Uh, I, sir, I, I don't have the, the grand total of that procurement figure 
Why not? I mean, I, this isn't a strange question to ask. I want to know what the program's going to cost. Yes, sir. Can anybody tell me what the program's going to cost? Is there anyone behind you who can tell me what the program's going to cost? Well, in, sir, I can give you in, in rough terms, the, uh, the total procurement figure is approximately $200 billion. Yeah. Okay, would GAO answer this? But, but it, I'm, I'm just a little, Mr. Volkman, you can't tell me what this program's going to cost? Why not? Uh, we could get the information for the record, Mr. Chairman, but uh, this I, is off the top of my head, I don't know what this, it is. This is a hearing on the Joint Strike Fighter, correct? Yes, sir. I am asking, like, the basic of basic questions, what does the program cost us? Why would I have a difficult time getting a question answered like that? And why would someone have to come back to me? Why, why is that not important? Sir, I can give you... Um, that figure, it's roughly... I know what it says there. Yeah. It's roughly $200 billion for the entire procurement program for that 2443 number. I'll tell you what, before this hearing ends, I want someone to tell me what the program's going to cost. I want you to do that, because I have a document that tells me what it's going to cost, and I want to know if it's right or not. But I'm not going to tell you, because you're the people who are doing it. Would GAO tell me what this program's going to cost? The number, the support costs have not yet been defined, but for R&D and procurement, for the numbers that the general mentioned, we have said about $200 billion. I, I'm going to ask the J.O., do you know what this program is supposed to cost? When we build, how many planes, and do we know what it's supposed to cost? I feel like I'm going through a game here. I mean, if you tell me the F-22, you tell me we're going to build this many planes and it's going to cost us this amount of dollar. And then the next hearing we have, you tell me we, it's going to cost us more dollars and we're going to build less planes. And the next hearing we have after that, they say it's going to even cost more dollars and we're going to build less planes. And, and it strikes me that the reason why you don't want to tell me is we don't want to put a number to it because we don't want to be held accountable to it. Basic question, what is this going to cost? Sir, I have the answer for you here in my uh, documents. Uh, it's, um, for the 2443 number, it's uh, $162 billion. And that's consistent with the uh, select acquisition report that uh, came over early this year. General, I'm sorry. I, I, I want to know what the program's going to cost us total when we're all done, when we've ordered all our planes, when we've ordered... What my briefing paper tells me is that we estimate we're going to order 2,457 aircraft. I'm told it's, going to, uh, it's estimated cost in current dollars for those aircraft is going to be $1.197 trillion. Sir, the figures I have immediately available here are um, the cost of the development program, which is baselined at $33 billion, plus the 162 procurement, that's 195 the, the large figure that you cite would include um, some assumptions about the operating and support costs over the lifetime of the airplane, and I don't have those immediately with me. The information that we rely on. A little louder, please. The information that we rely on is in the December 2002 selected acquisition report. That those are the most current dollars that we have. And in the. And what, what does that mean? The 2002 base year dollars. It means the costs change. I won't say continually, but change frequently. And well, it, unless we're willing to state the numbers, uh, it's kind of hard to know how things change. Does GAO have a, have they looked at the total number of planes we want to build and the total cost that we anticipate it's going to require us to spend? I had lots of questions, but I, I want to get by this one first. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm looking at people looking at me like I'm asking something I shouldn't be asking. And I'm, I'm like mystified by it. It is a hearing on the Joint Strike Fighter. We don't have a lot of hearings on it. It would seem to me that this would be like, this is what it's costing now, and then we may have to change it later, and so on, and these are reasons why we're changing it. Um, so, uh, 
Uh, before the hearing's over, I would like uh, DOD to ask someone to call someone to tell me how much these planes are all going to cost and, um, and uh, have a sense of it. That's what I would like. Why don't we do this? Uh, while that's being done... Mr. Chairman, yeah. would, would you like to even recess for a few minutes no, to no, send them no, to... No, no, no. You can ask them your question in a second. I, they, they have someone else that can get the answer. Someone can get up and make a phone call or something. Um, I don't mean to sound arrogant. I'm just, uh, I'm just kind of like amazed. Um, let me ask you this. Uh, how much uh, has the program increased since we locked in prices with our allies? And which allies did we lock in the prices? Mr. Volkman, maybe you can answer. Which allies have we locked in the price with so far? The, uh, the allies who are participating in the uh, systems design and demonstration phase of the program are the UK, Australia, Netherlands, uh, Italy, Norway, Denmark, uh, Turkey, and Canada. I, I, and, I, and Canada. I must have old data. I have that we have three tiers. We have UK is a, a one tier, the two tier is Italy and Netherlands, and three tier is Turkey, Norway, Australia, Canada, and Denmark. Is that just? That's correct. Okay. So we have three tiers, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And are we locked in uh, to the price of the UK? The, the UK has uh, agreed to a contribution of $2 billion to the systems design and development demonstration. Is that, is that a yes? I'm sorry? Is that a yes? Are we locked into a price? I think he's asking. If the price goes up, do they have to pay the increased price? There's no agreement on, uh, as the GAO report mentions, there's no agreement that uh, if the program exceeds the current estimate for systems design and development of about $33 billion, there's no obligation for the UK to fund a share of, the, uh, of any overruns. However, we expect that they would okay. uh, if so it were necessary. Okay, so the bottom line is, we, they have only, they have a lock, they have agreed to price, but we are hoping that if the price, if it costs more, that they will pay their share. Is that correct? They've agreed to contribute $2 billion. If, in the event that there's an overrun to this phase of the program, we would negotiate with them to share in the cost of that overrun. And how about with Italy and Netherlands? It's, it's the same. The, okay. and, the, and how about with Turkey, Norway, Australia, Canada, and Denmark? We would do the same thing. Okay. And explain to me the difference of these three tiers. Well, the, the differences in the three tiers have, to, of course, to do with the uh, amount of money that is contributed to the program by the particular partner. So in the case of the UK, uh, it's a $2 billion contribution to the program, in the case which is Tier 1. In the case of Italy and the Netherlands, who are at Tier 2, it's approximately, it's a billion dollars on the part of, of the Italy, uh, of over $800 million on the part of the Netherlands. And then the remaining Tier 3 partners have contributed approximately $150 million uh, each to the, the program. Let to me the just follow this design. one point up, Mr. Chairman, uh, if I could. Let me understand, um, it, what does being a one-tier versus a two-tier versus a three-tier give you? What do you buy when you're one-tier versus three-tier? What the... Uh, what the, the partners will receive as a result of their participation in the program is a voice in the conduct of the program. So they will have, uh, each of the partners has representation in the program office. In the case of uh, the United Kingdom, they have a, uh, uh, a national deputy. They'll have uh, 10 staff who are fully integrated into the uh, Joint Strike Fighter uh, Program Office. Is uh, it, yeah. <clears throat> okay. In the case of, the, I mean, I, I could go through all of them if you no, like. And, and is it basically that if you're one tier, you get to have a little bit more say how this plane turns out, and if you're third tier, you basically buy whatever was made? Is well, that the difference? All of the, all of the partner nations have some voice in the management of the program. Okay. And, and in fact, I mean, General Hudson would probably be uh, better uh, able to answer the specific role that they have in the program. Let me just tell you, and then I'll, I'll come back for the second round. I, if, 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 uh, General, if you could just write this down or someone in your staff, this is the information I have. I'd like to know if it's true. I have that the cost of the program in current dollars is 
estimated ultimately to be 1.197 trillion, that it amounts to 81 million per aircraft, that uh, we're anticipating building 2,457 200, of these aircraft, that the Air, the Air Force is going to ultimately have 1,763, that the Navy and the Marines ultimately it will have about 680, and that adds up to 2,443, and the difference, I, I basically made an assumption, was prototype between the 2,457 total aircraft that I had originally said versus adding up the Air Force and the Navy and Marines at 2,443 um, as, as prototypes. Now, if what I have is bad, we can blame it on bad staff work, but if it's not wrong, I want to know. And so before we adjourn, in fact, we're not adjourning today, Mr. Chairman, with your permission, until we get this information. I mean, we may recess, but, and, and we'll go from there, okay, for me. Thank you. I, I'm assuming, although I've not seen a whole lot of activity occur behind the table um, where you are all sitting, that someone is currently working to get this done for our chairman. Yes, sir, that is correct. Great. Um, obviously, there were two focuses of this hearing, the first being the, the, um, the issue of, um, of um, cost sharing with our international partners and the second being technology transfer. We're all aware of the overall arching issues of the cost overruns of the program and the uh, issues of the management of the program. Um, obviously, there are some positives to the program. Uh, this is a learning uh, program and that there's never been anything of this size in um, a program both in international partners and DOD cross services uh, that has been done before. Um, and certainly uh, the lessons that are learned here are going to be very valuable. Um, but what is obviously important is as we go through the process of learning is implementing and incorporating what we're learning into what we're doing as we're, we're moving forward. And, and with that, JO's comments are certainly very important and have been, been very helpful. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very much intrigued by the, the issue of the foreign partners uh, not being required to share in cost overruns while also having uh, an opportunity to participate uh, in the program uh, during the, the phases where we've already experienced cost overruns. Uh, and my understanding in this program is that in addition to the United States companies and contractors, that there also are foreign companies and contractors <laughs> that are participating in this. Is that correct, Mr. Volkman? Yes, sir, that's correct. Could you please tell me what percentage of the overall cost overruns can be attributed to the foreign companies and the foreign participation? And obviously there's a breakdown as to where those dollars go. Um, do we know to what extent the foreign companies are enjoying the benefits of the cost overrun while at the same time those foreign countries are not being burdened with the cost overruns? Uh, to my knowledge, sir, um, international industrial participation has not caused any change in the program or our um, cost estimate either for development or for production. Now that's really interesting. Why, why is that then? Um, yes, wh where are the cost overruns coming from then? Well, sir, I believe that uh, you are referring to the change in the estimate for the development program between the milestone B cost, which was from October of 01, uh, submitted to the Congress in uh, early uh, 02, and the uh, estimate that was submitted early this year. That was a change from the $30 billion baseline to 33 that accounted for two items. One was the cost to do the non-recurring work on the weapon system to ensure that we were uh, technically that is on the uh, airplane and its associated elements in full compliance with uh, national disclosure policy for procurement of airplanes by uh, international partners. And the other was a change in the estimate to do the development work on the General Electric Engine Program. Back at the milestone B in October of 2001, the estimate for the General Electric Engine work was for a limited um, interchangeability qualification of that engine, that it, and by interchangeability I mean the ability of either the General Electric or the Pratt engine to operate within the airplane on an equivalent basis without any change in common hardware or interfaces between the engine and the airplane. Um, af since that point, we, or DOD, decided that 
the qualification program would be for the full GE engine, so there was some additional design work, ground test and flight test work that would be required to ensure that both the full GE and the Pratt engine were interchangeable within the JSF. So those two things were the reason for the change in the development uh, price from the Milestone B to the SAR that was submitted earlier this year and nothing else in there changed. Could okay, I just ask a question, Mr. Just, Chairman? Certainly, Mr. Chairman. Do you agree with what was just said? I would also I would only note that GE is partnered with. Um, no, but the cost numbers and the increases. Your numbers were different than his numbers. The general's numbers. The m no, ours are the same for that period of time. Okay. From what period of time? From October 01, when the, the estimate was submitted until today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, well, let's, let's take the, the one aspect of, of the positive. Um, in this, this process, uh, there are lessons that are being learned in managing programs that are um, cross um, <laughs> DOD departments and then also international. Um, in addition to the Joint Strike Fighter, there's an opportunity for uh, these lessons learned both in management procurement and in also um, relations that, and policies that might be helpful. Could you tell us some of the things that have been learned that may have not been known before since this is a, a, um, a enormous undertaking that can be applied to future systems uh, for all of our benefit? Yes, sir. Um a couple of those lessons would be in the area of requirements. A little over three years ago, the United States Air Force, the United States Navy, the United States Marine Corps, and the United Kingdom signed a joint operational requirements document. This has been one of the real success stories in the program, and that is one that I believe that um, would be a good lesson learned for other programs in the sense that we worked for about five years on that requirements document, we got a good solid set of requirements that looked at not only combat capability that was needed in the post-2010 threat environment, but also considered affordability for development, for procurement, and for owning and operating the airplane. So that was a very positive one. The other was the, the other lesson I would, uh, that I would provide is in the area of looking forward in terms of uh, technology transfer. We have done a great deal of work over the last uh, almost two years now to look at uh, technology transfer and uh, the risks and uh, benefits associated with that, not only from a government to government perspective, but from an industry to industry perspective. As you know, the first global project authorization was approved by Congress at the end of this past year. Uh, this was the first global project authorization. It did take some time to implement, but it is working successfully, and State Department is working the implementing agreements in less than or equal to the five-day uh, goal that they signed up for. So although that one took um, a good while and much work was put into that, that's a very, very positive uh, lesson learned for programs of this type in the future. Thank you, General. Mr. Schrock? I'm not sure I have any questions as much as a comment. And I guess I kind of understand where they're all coming from. I was, in my two and a half decades in the Navy, I saw every program that ever hit the street had cost overruns. And I guess I asked why then, and uh, I ask even more so now. I just, I don't know how we get our hands around it unless, as I said earlier, from the time a concept is put on paper until the time it hits the water, and then in the case of the Navy or in the air, in the case of the Air Force, so much happens, so much technology changes, so many ideas or okay. uh, flow into the, the process, like to your office, General, that that's what causes the cost overruns. I, is that right? Am I way off base on that? Or? That's their cost. That's their cost. Okay. Okay. Good. Well, one of the things we know, sir, as you have pointed out, is that technology can change over time. And if uh, requirements, uh, that is, new requirements, are allowed to flow unabated into a program, then that does indeed drive cost. And that's why 
We have had since the start of the development program here what we call a configuration steering board, which is in charge of um, working with the DOD acquisition communities and the warfighter representatives who set the requirements. Those two together work to ensure that we have a, a disciplined uh, approach to any uh, potential changes that we might entertain in the program because it will drive cost. And I just wonder if there are ways to, to, to shorten the timelines. I know Admiral Vern Clark, Chief of Naval Operations, is trying to get the, you know, the LCS, the littoral combat ship, in the water in just a matter of a couple years to hopefully prevent some of this, but to have it have a system that's plug and play so if there are technology changes, you unplug one thing and plug in another. And I think that's a, that's a unique concept, and I think it's going to work. Is that a possibility for some of the new aircraft coming well, down the pike? Yes, sir, it is. And in fact, um, we designed uh, that exact capability into this airplane in terms of the avionics and software. We did it from the ground up. We worked about five years on what we call an open architecture because we know that just as we see in uh, personal computers at home, we see fast changes in technology where the technology gets better and, in fact, cheaper and it's, uh, it works better. We know the same thing happens within uh, avionics that go into military airplanes. So what we designed into the backbone of the Joint Strike Fighter was what we call this open architecture. Right. And what that does is it gives us the capability to cope with obsolescent parts and it gives us the capability to insert technology into this airplane in a way that we have to do an absolute minimum of regression testing. And we have the capability to change software modules and, in fact, compete those modules if we like due to the way the architecture is defined and implemented within the airplane. And in, in many ways, the avionics and software on this airplane, that is the sensors, how the, the data from the sensors is processed and displayed to the pilot and used in combat, is the heart and soul of lethality and survivability. So the open architecture is something new for us, for the complete system within a tactical jet. It will provide us tremendous flexibility in the long term and cut down the cost to insert new technology and deploy it into the, into the field. This may be an unfair question, but I can understand how you can shorten the time land on a ship, get it in the water. Why can't we do that? <laughs> when was the when did the Joint Strike Fighter, when did somebody first say Joint Strike Fighter? How, what, I should know the year. How long ago was that? I'm sorry, sir, I didn't understand when, the question. When the Joint Strike Fighter concept first went to paper and start, people started developing, how long ago was that? Uh, the uh, concept demonstration phase, which was the competitive phase between Boeing and Lockheed, started in November of 96. Okay. There was a very short competition before that, but that was the main competitive phase. And, and then they're going to, I guess they'll be in the fleet in, in your squadrons in the Air Force in 08. See, yes. that's 12 years. Yes, sir. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not criticizing or complaining, but I'm saying, you know, the way it, in, in ships now, you can do it in a few years. Why can't that same concept, why can't that same mentality be put into the development of some of these new air systems? There may be a log totally logical reason, but... Yes, sir. Well, we have done um, some things to cut down the cycle time and ensure that we don't overrun this timeline we have now. For example, when, the, when Lockheed and Boeing competed for the contract award for Joint Strike Fighter, each company had to fly and demonstrate um, a, a conventional takeoff and landing variant short takeoff and landing and carrier variant. They did that and those, each company built two airframes that right. flew the three variants and proved that. I remember that. Those were uh, not prototypes, however, they were just concept demonstrators, mm -hmm. so they didn't have a, a representative set of avionics or uh, low observable coatings or things like that on the airplane. So the fact that we flew those concept demonstrators helps us tremendously for understanding what capability we have and being able to have confidence in the timeline that we have now. And in fact, uh, two years from this fall, we will fly the first of our full-up developmental airplanes that will have the required 8,000 hours of structural life. These airplanes will have the representative avionics in them, the weapons bays, and everything that the operational airplane will have. In 08, our first production airplanes uh, hit the ramp and we began, uh, we began testing and getting them ready for full up operational capability in the Marine Corps in 2010, the Air Force in 2011, and the Navy in the UK in 2012. This fall we have our first engine in the test cell. So it's, um, 
It, ta it does take a few years to put all the piece parts together to bring the airplane into the field and ensure it's correct, but with the uh, timelines that we have, it, it all fits together and it's uh, not too far away. But the first demonstration phase, I guess, was to prove it wouldn't fall out of the air. Yes, sir. It was designed to prove that whether or not the competing companies had the ability to design and yeah. fly an airplane that would meet the fundamental needs of the services. My time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman? I am um, pretty much a fan of this program. It, it, it may not seem evident from the way I feel right now, but uh, I think it makes sense to try to have three branches use the same plane. I think there is logic uh, that if you could use 80% of the same part in a plane, that makes sense. Uh, but, it, but in the chairman's uh, statement, uh, he pointed out that this could be a model for 21st century weaponry acquisition, or it could fall prey to the same cost growth, scheduling delays, and inter-service bickering that's plagued so much in the Cold War. That's one thing he pointed out. This is one thing we want to get a handle on. And, and then he said, today we ask whether international participation and technology sharing are being managed so as to maximize benefits and minimize risks to the Department of Defense, DOD's larger program. That's one thing we want to also have a sense of. And he, said, and he pointed out at the request of the GAO Accounting Office, at our request, we asked them to examine the complex set of relationships between the Joint Strike Fighter Program and its eight international partners. We want to know about the cost-sharing benef benefits uh, that, that it go in this program. Um, he pointed out in their, in their report, and I want you to speak to this, uh, I'd like GAO to speak to this. Uh, the release today finds the JSF program in stronger need of management and oversight because of international participants currently have no requirement or incentive to share in cost growth. Now, I'm not sure how that's been answered. And then um, he pointed out the level of collaboration also demands greater access to sensitive defense technologies than we are accustomed to, and we're trying to sort that out. So that's kind of our objective. I mean, you know, it would have been nice, and we will get it, uh, to know what this program is supposed to cost based on our numbers today. And we know it would be different, but it gives us a target uh, to then begin to say, well, why is it going to cost more? Or why is it going to cost less? What are all those new things that have changed? So um, I'd like to know from GAO, uh, what are you saying about this program? Am I to feel good about it or bad about it or somewhere in between? As you know, Mr. Chairman, we believe that the program went forward um, into this phase before it was ready to do that because its technologies um, were not mature. Um, that is, ta that time has already yeah, that's passed. Yeah, that's a, a criticism that you've also had with the joint, uh, uh, excuse me, with uh, the, the F-22 program. That's correct. And, and your point is that we're, we're actually starting to produce before we have the technology. We're starting to okay. go into design. So that's yes. one criticism. I would like that addressed by uh, the rest here. So what, what is the answer to that issue? Were you, I, I, this is not a criticism. Were, did you hear her point, or were you just kind of talking about something else? The first criticism and concern was both with the F-22 and the Joint Strike Fighter. We're going into production before the technology is there to support the production. What is the, what is the response that we have in that regard? Well, sir, the Department of Defense, prior to the Milestone B, which is in October of 01, as part of the uh, requirements to go through the Defense Acquisition Board review, which, which uh, Mr. Aldrich chaired at that time, uh, we did a report that looked at the readiness of the system to enter the system development and demonstration phase. And the review of the documents and the, re and the work that DOD did showed that it was ready to go. I know that. Okay, so the answer is you disagree that you think that your production, the technology was there to support the production based on this study. Is that your answer? Yes, sir. Okay, what's the second one? What's the second? Yes. You're back to me. I'm sorry. Um, I'd love it if you talk a little louder, too. Sure. The, um, the issues that we raise in this report are more of a prospective nature than they are of something that's actually happened. Okay. But what, what we are looking at first the basis upon which you enter into a cooperative program has to do with equitable sharing, which is not defined very well, but still is a concept that underlies um, You're concerned about who's going to ultimately pay, and will they pay the full cost of the program? We You're think it should be recognized that 
the con financial contribution that was part of the basis for having a cooperative program will change over time. There are percentage, this has been established, it was originally established in a percentage range. So, for example, a level one partner paid, was going to contribute roughly 10 percent, a level two partner roughly three to five percent, a level three partner roughly one to two percent. Right, those were the guidelines that were laid down as we started into this program. Okay, On now, a percentage... Did, did that give, in my way of looking at it, and, and maybe Mr. Volkman, you could respond to this, I would just think, and tell me why there's a reason, and I just don't know it. I would think you would, you would basically figure out the, the cost of the, to produce this plane, and then you would set the price based on the cost, and then whoever wanted this plane would pay that cost. I mean, that's kind of the way I would look at it. But there's a reason why we're not doing it that way, because. Well, I, I, I'm not really sure how to answer the question. We, we arranged our goals at the outset were to have uh, a level one partner contribute 10 percent to the system's design uh, and demonstration costs as we knew it at the time. Uh, obviously, as a result of our negotiations, uh, not all of our partners or prospective partners uh, were able to meet a strict 10 percent goal. So we, had, we and, and how do we come up with that 10 percent? Yeah, maybe I should maybe I should explain that I was recommended I explain that this the phase of the program we're in right now is to develop the airplane and demonstrate that it's ready to go into production. Right. So it's a very uh, lengthy. Uh, and uh, part of the program where we're designing uh, the plane so it's ready to be manufactured. Yeah. Me, uh, we've seen both planes. We saw them both together uh, before they were chosen. I mean, I'm talking about the Boeing plane versus Lockheed. And so we, we've had a little bit of knowledge on the contest that's gone, taken place. But what I'm trying to understand, there's a reason, and it may be a very good reason that you went out on the hearing, it, 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 the, it was the thought that when you participate, it was there the thought that somehow we might develop this plane but never ultimately uh, produce it? I mean, in other words, that we would go through this process and decide it just was, we couldn't afford it? I mean, we ultimately figured we were going to build this plane, is that correct? That's correct. So just get me by this hurdle. Why wouldn't we just say to whoever wants to buy this plane, you've got to pay uh, this cost? And why, why did we decide we wanted someone to pay 10 percent? What's the logic? There's a reason, but I don't know it. I think it was a, it was a judgment at the time as to uh, what the likely uh, participation would be among various partner nations who uh, uh, would, might be interested in participating with us uh, in, the, in the program. Uh, I mean, clearly, uh, most nations cannot afford to join as partners in a program at the, uh, at the same extent that the United States can. So I think, you know, we made a judgment that a level one partner would uh, likely to be able to contribute uh, the, the approximately $2 billion into the program that the United Kingdom has uh, agreed to, uh, to pay. Uh, we made some other judgments as to Does what a level three Does that give them the right to buy the plane at less than a third tier person would pay? No. <clears throat> let, let, let me, let me I've, I've been listening to this and may, maybe I can help help with this. Um, the condition for being a level one, two, or three partner um, has to do with the level of contribution those countries want to make to the SDD right. phase. It does not at all require them to buy aircraft, and it also does not stipulate, stipulate anything about the price at which they will buy aircraft if they come to decide to buy aircraft okay, later on. Okay, so tell on. me why they would do it. Why, why even bother to participate? Um, what, what do they, I'm trying to see what both sides get here. I don't know what people get out of this. A, a, number, a number of the countries um, are, were interested because they do think that they will buy the Joint Strike Fighter aircraft. And so they wanted to be present at the creation, as it were. The UK is probably the very best example of that, where the UK decided that it was willing to, to forego developing its own tactical fighter industry to the extent that would be required if they had to develop this aircraft on their own and they would partner with us instead. A very early, very robust, um, tight working relationship 
and the most funding into SDD. Also, perhaps not surprisingly, one of the most important features of the, um, the technological innovation of the Joint Strike Fighter came from the UK. Um, the lift fan technology, all, a lot of the work that has to do with the Marine Corps variant. Other countries saw this program as an opportunity to learn about tactical aviation, whether they decided to buy the airplane or not. The Netherlands, for instance, decided that their knowledge and insight based on this investment in the program would help allow their aerospace industry to be a major pillar in their own country. So they wanted to learn to the maximum extent available, keeping in mind the foreign disclosure requirements, et cetera, about this program. Do you um, understand why we're asking these questions? I mean, the, the, what you're describing now uh, raises good questions for us to ask, and it raises, you know, some real concerns as well. I mean, we're trying to, we're trying to get, have a sense, our, our partner's going to be paying the cost that they should be paying. Uh, and what do they get out of this? What do we get out of it? Well, one of the things they get out, it seems to me, is they get our technology. One of the things you're suggesting to me is that we have gained and learned some technologies from them. Correct. Um, and I think, you know, and uh, so I think that needs to be put on the table. But I'm, I'm, I'm still, it seems to me what you're saying is if, if you, if you either one, two, or three, you get to participate in the program, uh, and you get to have some influence as to how the program. So now I'm going to ask a logical question. Does being one give you more ability to influence the program than being three? I think, General Hudson, you can answer that because you've worked that yep. day to day to date. Yes, sir, it does. Okay. The primary way that it does that is that in the Joint Operational Requirements document that I mentioned earlier, there are four signatories on it. That was signed in the springtime of the year 2000. The signatories are the U.S. Air Force, Marine Corps, the Navy, and the United Kingdom. So there is an advantage to being a signatory on the requirements document. They also have, the UK has uh, 10 people that work for me in my office, and so they have uh, people spread throughout uh, my team working various jobs on the team. Okay, now, and, Mr. Chairman, do, do, do you mind if I keep going? And, 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 and sir, I have... Please proceed. Yeah. Yes, I, ha I have the numbers that you asked for earlier. Okay, you, why don't we hold off on them? I'm not going to forget about them. Um, the, uh, so what you, what you have said is they, um, they get to have some say, and if you're one tier, you get to have a little more say than two or three, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, um, does that get them to be able to have an aircraft uh, sooner than some other country? In other words, are they first at being, do they get to jump us? Do we get all our, you know, the number that I gave you of 2,443, do we, do we get all our planes and they get theirs, or do we do a kind of a cost sharing? I'm mean, not cost sharing, but they get so many as we get so many. How does that work? The United States buys the first production airplanes, sir, plan now for 2006. Uh, the United States procurement profile will go probably for about 20 years past that. What will happen is that as the U.S. buys airplanes and deploys them into the fleet, uh, there will be enough production capacity to allow for airplanes to be built for partner nations. No, but you're, you're missing my question. I, I, it, you gave me a long answer, I think, with all respect to what could be shorter. Uh, I'm just simply asking, do the Brits, basically because of their participation, get to be able to say, well, you get the first 100, then we get 10, you get the next, and so on. I mean, is it that kind of arrangement? Well, well, it goes Otherwise, by I'm wondering why they would participate. Well, it goes by, by priority, and they, as the level one partner, they, they be, are able to procure first amongst the partner countries, and they start in 08. I understand the U.S. comes first in yes, this. Sir. I understand that. We're putting up most of the costs, with all due respect. Um, and, and I just wanted to know, this has got to be something that's been talked about. Is, is this classified information? Well, th they do have an advantage in procurement because they are earlier. Is there an agreement in writing that says how many planes they get at a certain time? Or is this still to be decided? It's still to be decided, sir. You know, the, the UK has a, they have a goal which they have stated of 150 Joint Strike Fighters. We know that they intend to begin procurement in 2008. The exact number of airplanes year by year over the life of their procurement is yet to be determined. Okay. Uh, why don't you give me those numbers and then I'll yes, sir. give them an Okay, these are the numbers that I have here. You were correct 
1763 for the Air Force and 680 for the Navy and the Marine Corps. That makes the 240, 2443 that you right. cited earlier. Okay. Now, there are 14 jets that will be flown in the development program. Right. At one time, there used to be 13, and this goes back about three or four years. Well, fine. So you don't have to give me more details, so it's 14. Yep. Now, now, what are we what are we looking at now? What what are we looking at the cost of this? Okay, for the development program here, thirty three billion. For the production program, and this is just the U.S. airplanes, one hundred and sixty two billion. And our estimate for the operating and support costs for the U.S. airplanes is three three two billion. So this number that I have of one point one is way off. One point one point one trillion is just totally Yes, sir. I don't know what the basis for that is. I, I'd love to see those numbers and try sure. to figure out where they come okay. from, but I, these are the numbers that we carry in my office. Okay, and if I add up all of those numbers, uh, what did you get to? That's I about. In, I need in your words, not mine. So I don't want to add it up and put it on the record. I want you to put it on the record. Yes, sir. I'm doing that. And 33, 162, and 332. I get 527, sir. Okay, so you're saying 527 buys uh, 2,457 aircraft. Yes, sir. It does a development. It buys them and it supports them over the life of the fleet. Supports them? It's. I mean, it's not just the cost of them. It's the operation. I just want to know the cost of this plane. Yes, sir. That the the 33 billion does the development work. And the 162 is the production? The 162 is production, okay, yes, sir. Okay, I'll, I'll just take those two. So those are basically, that's the, that's the cost of the aircraft. Yes, sir. 195, you want to put on the record? The 33 and the 162? Yes, sir, to do, yes, sir, to do the ongoing development and to procure the airplanes. It's 100, uh, $195 billion. Yes, sir. For 2,457 aircraft. Yes, sir. Okay, and maybe one of your folks can put on the record then the per cost of the aircraft from that, just nice division? It differs by service number. Oh, it differs by, yeah, but the total, the, there's an average. Yeah. One, could I ask one last question with your, Mr. Rockin? Certainly, yeah. please. Okay. Um, I would just like to just clarify a question I asked earlier to GAO. Uh, when you were giving me costs, General, I, I seem surprised by your number versus GAO. I'm looking on page 13. Maybe I misunderstood you because I wasn't listening as well as I should have. But on page 13 in the second paragraph, it says DOD, this is in the Joint Strike Fighter Acquisition Report. It says DOD and the program office officials told us there could be instances where the partners would not be expected to share cost increases. For example, cost estimates for the system development and demonstration phase have increased on multiple occasions since the program started in 1996. During that time, the expected cost for this phase went from $21.2 billion to $33.1 billion, and I get a, cost, I get a difference of $12.9 billion, and I thought you gave me a $3 billion, and I'm just, that's why I asked J.O. those numbers, and you said you agreed with a $3 billion. It, sir, the, the $3 billion number I, I gave was from uh, the milestone B in October of 01 to the report that came over here early this year. So I just, different time frame? Yes, sir. Yes. So you agree with GAO that it's 12.9 yes, since, okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, could I add something to sure. the, we came up with, instead of the 195, the roughly 200 billion for the total cost because we added the additional development of about $4, $4 billion that was um, in the concept demonstration phase. So you added five billion more. Do you concur with that number? Well, four, it was four something. Okay. So I said roughly two hundred. Yes, sir. That's correct if you count the competitive phase. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for getting those numbers to me, General. Thank you. Well, Chairman Shea said that he's a fan of this program, and certainly I can tell you that that, that I am also. And I think that we, in looking at this. Um, the Joint Strike Fighter, people are very excited about its capabilities and what it's going to be able to do for a military. And I have a series of questions, but, but first I'd like to pause for a second, General, and if you could highlight some of those for us as to, in the Joint Strike Fighter, you know, what are we talking about and trying to achieve here? 
Well, sir, there are several, uh, several very important things I'd like to highlight for you briefly. First off is the ability to design, develop, and deploy an airplane that is highly common between a variant that not only works off a U.S. aircraft carrier, but off an exped expeditionary airfield such as the Marine Corps might use and from a conventional runway that the Air Force might use. Uh, this gives us, by means of high commonality within the airframe and within the avionics and software in the airplane, a very affordable airplane to buy and also to operate. Within any system, the largest expense and the life cycle cost is the cost of owning the operate and operating the airplane with high commonality. We can certainly mo make inroads into what we know is the high cost of operating and owning um, most systems. The other thing is that we'll be able to do is we have an airplane that is uh, multi-role in nature, that is it can accomplish both uh, the air-to-ground mission and it has inherent air-to-air -air capability. And um, we've been able to design that such that it is highly common, which also gives us a broad base of operation to cut into operating and support costs. And we have interoperability as one of our key performance parameters. We know that in coalition warfare, we want this airplane to be able to interoperate, in other words, pass voice and data information with ships at sea, with facilities on the ground, with other airplanes in the air, and with spaceborne assets. So we design this uh, capability up front. This weekend, um, I, I led a congressional delegation of, of 11 members uh, that went to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base that included the Chairman of Armed Services, uh, Duncan Hunter, the Chairman of Air and Land, who's also the Vice Chairman of the overall Armed Services Committee, uh, Kurt Weldon, to look at the development of science and technologies and research and development. Uh, we um, had a, a, uh, a focus of uh, you know, the technology of tomorrow that's going to be for the battlefields of tomorrow. Um, the, uh, one of the phrases that um, we heard from uh, Mr. Shin Ms. Shinazi, sorry, um, is um, that the technology has not been mature, but yet you move forward into different phases. And one of the things that, that I find in, in this whole process is, is that to, to some extent, um, when you're talking about research and development, you're talking about inventions, you're talking about creativity, you're talking about doing something that someone has not done before. We don't want to go buy something that is yesterday's technology. We, want to don't, we don't even want to buy today's technology. We want to buy tomorrow's technology. And managing how we incorporate tomorrow's technology into a process that is being managed today is a difficult one financially. Um, the um, the phrase mature technology, though, is one that, that I would like you to respond to, General, in, in the fact that it does seem to me that this is a process, specifically um, the Joint Strike Fighter, uh, which is one that at the same time that we want to manage costs, we are talking about innovation and we are talking about projecting toward um, the technology of, of tomorrow in this and the inherent impact that that's going to have on, on cost. Yes, sir. One of the significant challenges that we have in this development program is to integrate the technologies that we identified in the last phase of the program into our design. And I, so I'd like to give you a couple examples of work that we did in the last phase of the program that we are now integrating into the design. The first one is in the radar. Uh, we did some work in the last phase of the program on technology maturation so that we could build a high-performing radar in a very affordable fashion. That technology demonstration work we did in the last phase has paid off handsomely. In fact, approximately next April, we will have our first radar hit the test bench. So that's a good example of technology maturation work that was done in that last phase. We're building that now, and we will begin testing it next year. But it gives us the capability to put the technology we need in the airplane in an affordable manner. There's an example in the subsystems in the airplane. We did a project where we took an F-16 and tore out the traditional hydraulic flight controls in the airplane and replaced it with what we call, um, it's actually a system that runs uh, by digital control to actuators located at the flight control services, eliminating 
the usual lines and hydraulic requirements in an airplane. We demonstrated this. It is now part of our baseline design. It is brand new technology that we've never used like this in a fighter before. So we've captured that in our design process. So we have uh, attempted to focus in this phase on the integration of those technologies, which we know need to be in the airplane to make sure it's survivable, lethal, supportable, and affordable, but yet allow us to keep ourselves on track for schedule and performance and cost in this phase of development. In the materials that we have for uh, this hearing um, from, from the staff of the committee, uh, they highlight some of the cost savings that we will experience or have experienced as a result of the Joint Strike Fighter Program's structure and its goals, being you know, one, that the um, services anticipate that the size of their order will hold down production costs because it's a common um, a common uh, base or common craft that, that's, that's being uh, d designed. Um, that the acquisition program's aff is affordability is impacted by reducing the development, production, and ownership costs of the program relative to other fighter uh, procurements. And that you've incorporated various DOD and commercial best practices in the Joint Strike Fighter program. Still, obviously, though that, that is not enough to have warded off the cost increases that, that everyone wants to avoid. And, and the program can be open to criticism as we've looked to others that have not shared in those cost increases. But I, I think that, and I'd like you to clear this up for me because it, as we've had this discussion, the, the, um, when we talk about cost and the different phases um, and what uh, the partners will pay for their various portion of costs, once this plane actually gets into production, the full cost of production of the plane will be paid by anyone non-U.S. who purchases that plane, correct? Yes, sir, that is correct. So the, the concern, though, is, is that the initial costs, the development costs, the invention costs, um, are not, at a 100 percent basis, going to be placed or burdened onto that purchase price cost of a copy. Now, that's, that's what I'm getting from this hearing, is that so there will not be a recovery of the overall expectation of the of what we're going to be having spent to come up to the level of production. Yes, sir, it is correct that the partner countries are not required. We have the option of going to them for additional funds, but they are not required to share in development cost increase. And, and I guess that that's, that's where it, it begins to defy what people's normal uh, common sense expectation would be of how costs and prices are set. because. You know, generally, if someone is going to go uh, set about doing research and development for a product that they're going to put in pr production, they include those costs um, as to uh, what it took them to, to get to that point. And I think that that's where people are struggling here is that not only are they not going to be included, but they're also, um, even though they shared in a, in a portion of those other countries, they've, they're not sharing in the escalation of those costs as we get to the production point. And is that correct? Was that a correct description of, of basically what people are struggling with? Yes, sir. I, th I think you've got that. Uh, you, you have described that correctly. It is correct that when we come to the production of the airplanes, the partner countries or whoever else would procure the airplane pays the they pay the full price of the airplane, and also for operating and support they would pay the cost of uh, spare parts and the cost of training and so on and so forth, just like the United States would. But pay. they will not be paying the costs that have been expended. Uh, prior in research and development that takes it up to the point of production? No, sir, not unless during, if there are cost overruns in the development phase that the U.S. went to them for additional funds. If they produced those additional funds, they would, of course, share an increase in the cost of development. If they did not, they would not. And so and then their sharing of those costs though, does not bear a relationship to the per unit number that they'll be, be acquiring? That is correct, sir. Um, let's shift for just a second, Mr. Chairman, if you don't mind. Uh, the, the, um, thank you. The, uh, the issue of, of technology transfer, uh, we're almost uh, coming to a, a, uh, the, the planned ending point of, of the hearing, although I understand uh, from the Chairman that, that we may continue it. The, um, General, could you speak about the issue of technology transfer? I mean, here you are in, in a partnership where you're sharing technology uh, intentionally. I mean, you're sharing in technology because you want your product to be responsive to your customers which also may be your partners on battlefields. So you also want the sharing of knowledge there in technology as this is developed 
to, so that as a team, when these countries get together, they'll be more effective. I think one of the concerns that was raised, of course, is that you know your friend today may be your foe tomorrow. But in the group that you've put together, you know, perhaps the the, um, the degree of concern is not as high of those individuals. But there may be in the next level of that, you know, our friends' friends may not necessarily be our friends. Um, and could you talk about that expanding uh, distribution of technology transfer um, and and what? Uh, how that might be being addressed in this program. Yes, sir. We spent some years developing and uh, working on the process for Joint Strike Fighter. There is a rigorous process in place to determine which technologies can be transferred on an industry-to-industry -industry basis. Let's say, for example, from Lockheed Martin or one of their subs or suppliers to a company who would be performing Joint Strike Fighter work from another country. So that process is in place. We adhere to it uh, very carefully. There are measures in place to ensure that that technology is appropriate for transfer. We work that through the national uh, disclosure policy uh, community. And it is defined by what kind of authorizations exist for that technology transfer, either within the global project authorization or the various um, TAAs that might be put in place for this program. There are also equivalent agreements in place between the government of the United States and other participating governments as there would be for any type of cooperative uh, development program. These security agreements are in place. Uh, they are carefully structured within each one of our partner countries to ensure that any information that might be provided to these countries is carefully protected and that the individuals who get access to that information are properly vetted within their own systems as they are in ours. So we have that disciplined system in place for government to government as well as industry to industry. And uh, the importance of the technology transfer, I think, is uh, illustrated very well by the time it took to get the global project authorization in place. It was uh, very carefully done. It covers only unclassified information and only uh, unclassified information that is uh, not very sensitive. The rest is all done by the normal TAA process. So there's equivalents, or there's agreements and procedures in place to govern the transfer of this information on both sides. Mr. Turner, could I add to that? Yes, please. Um, I, I think one of the things that um, that we tried to raise in our report is the concept of expectations and how uh, there may be differing expectations on this program. Um, what we have seen and heard from some of the partner countries in here is that there is an expectation that they will have access to certain technology that they believe they need um, to um, not just develop and produce, but also to support this airplane. And that those expectations are probably uh, if not certainly going to run into conflict with previous decisions that the U.S. has made on transferring technology. The partner expectations for what technology they will have access to are not always going to be in accord with what the U.S. has certainly not done in the past and maybe is not willing to do right now. So one of the issues that, that we've looked at is this idea of supportability of this aircraft. Um, many of the partner countries want the ability to support, maintain and support the aircraft. There are significant technology transfer issues associated with that, and we have not yet determined what the support plan is going to look like. So what we've tried to do is say there, this is, the, the general described a set of safeguards in place, but there will continue to be pressure pushing on the policy level about how much technology we're going to transfer. I would say the, the GPA that has been referred to, the Global Project Authorization, is more a matter of process. How quickly can we get it through? Not what the decision should be as to whether or not to release it. Very good. That's a good point as to, to how we operationally do this and that, that, that being overly restrictive may impact our overall goals. Right. I appreciate you making that point. Mr. Chairman? Thank you. We're, we're getting towards the end here, but let me, um, let me go through a few um, questions as it relates to uh, uh, our 
as it relates to the issue of strategic best value sourcing, as some call it. And I'm going to read you the explanation before I read you the question, because I want to make sure the explanation is accurate. Uh, DOD and the Joint Strike Fighter Program Office have said that the use of competitive contracting is central to meeting partner expectations for industrial return and will assist in controlling program costs. Two things. In other words, one advantage is controlling uh, program costs. Another is we participate. We get to have our industry make some of the product that goes into making the airplane. Joint Strike Fighter officials use the term best value to describe this approach, which is a departure from other cooperative development programs that guarantee predetermined levels of work based on contribution. I guess I was kind of in the old world. I figure you contribute so much, then you get to make so much. Partner representatives generally agree with the Joint Strike uh, Fighter competitive approach to contracting, but some emphasize that their industry's ability to win Joint Strike Fighter contracts whose total value approaches or exceeds their financial contributions for the Joint Strike Fighters system development and demonstration phase is important for their continued involvement in the program. So um, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Volkman and, and uh, uh, General Hudson, describe the relationship between the strategic best value sourcing as described in the DOD Industrial Impact Study and the best value concept that has been promoted since the beginning of the system development and demonstration phase? Well, I think what we do in, in the award of subcontracts generally is we expect our, our prime contractors to make uh, contract, subcontract decisions on a best value basis. So if they can make it overseas, you make it overseas? Well, uh, what I'm... Uh, what I'm trying to do initially is to say that we ordinarily expect our contractors to, to make a decision as to who they subcontract with on what, I, what would okay. be characterized as a best and, value and, basis. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm just trying to understand it, and, and maybe I jumped in too quick, but since I already jumped in, what I'm hearing you say to me is wherever they can make the product the best and at the lowest cost, you want them to make it there. Right. So okay. if, if there were foreign sources that could, could make it, it at the best value, at, at the best cost. Okay. We would expect that they would go to foreign sources. Okay. Now, of course, it's a lot more complicated than that because of uh, limitations on certain foreign sourcing that are contained in laws or regulations. But as a general rule, yes, we would expect yeah, that they would go. Exceptionally, I understand that. We're, okay, now what? So, so in the in the case of the Joint Strike Fighter Program, uh, clearly one of the things that we would like to see is, is our our partner. Uh, countries who are participating in the program for their industries to benefit on a best value basis. Right. So there, so there is. I, I, I'm now going to the strategic sourcing concept. There is uh, some uh, value in uh, the prime contractors making decisions to award work in a particular country on a best value basis. But the is it accurate to say that if you are 10% of the total production, uh, excuse me, total of the development cost, that you, that you don't, aren't guaranteed that you'll have 10% of the production uh, contracting. That's not, you won't. Well, there's, there, at this phase of the program, uh, we're, not, uh, we're not making any commitments as far but, but as production. But the answer to the question was really yes. In other words, you're not, I'm repeating what I think you told me and tell me if I'm wrong. You're going to wherever you can make the product the best, uh, the best product at the lowest cost. As a general rule, that's the concept that guides you. So if the Brits contribute 10 percent of the development cost, if they did, they're not guaranteed that they get 10 percent of the production. That's correct. Okay. Now, in a helicopter that Sikorsky makes in my district, uh, as I was viewing the plant, the head was, uh, excuse me, the, 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 the frame was built by the Japanese. The tanks that are going to be on the outside of this aircraft um, are built by the Brazilians. And the argument to me now is, but the value added, the real you know, expensive value added stuff is still going to be done in the United States. Um, and so it's intriguing to see this, you know, this cage brought in and, and these various parts. They're coming from all over the world. I make an assumption 
that the Joint Strike Fighter is going to be made all over the world and that we hope that more than eight countries buy it. Is that an accurate statement? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Okay. Ms. Patrick, do you want to add anything? I, you're nodding in your head. I want to make sure it's, it doesn't yeah. get on the transcript. No, no, I, I, I do agree with, 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 with all that you said. Um, there, there is, it's, 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 a, it's really a very radical departure from the offset paradigm in that um, really never before have, have countries made investments in the SDD phase of a program um, in the way that the Joint Strike Fighter is structured. Um, and they make those investments um, without any guarantee of a proportionate um, amount of business in return for that. And so it could be more, it could be less than their proportion. Okay. But I think you kind of sense where I'm going. I mean, conceivably, first off, I would, in a chauvinistic way, like to think that Americans would make the best no matter what part it is. We wouldn't necessarily make the cheapest. But I would always make an assumption that we would make the best. Now, maybe that's an assumption I shouldn't. Having said that, I also make an assumption that when we're making a plane, that it's my obligation to make sure the best part is in, in every place. So that if, for, in, for instance, the Bra Brazilians can do something that makes the plane lighter and safer uh, or whatever, uh, I owe it to the men and women and to our country to make sure that that's what we buy. I'd like to think, again, though, that we could do it ourselves. But I know that in some cases it may be built uh, at lost cost and, and maybe even superior in some instances. What I'm wondering, though, is now I'm back to where I was in the beginning. I don't understand. You've got to explain to me in a way that I can understand why we're seeing a 1% investment in production with the, is the phase three. I mean, uh, Ms. Uh, About Shinasky, one to you 2%. said phase three. It's, are you, you level, three, level three was Shinasky. originally roughly 1% to 2%. Okay. I don't, I, don't understand, I don't understand that, unless it's to say, I mean, I can understand wanting to buy in at 1%. That's a pretty good deal. I like that part of the deal. I can understand why they want it. I don't quite un And it, it seems to me that it gives them uh, a plane before someone else who hasn't participated, logically, though you're saying that hasn't been resolved yet. Is that true, Ms. Pat Patrick? I think if your questions earlier were, do partner nations have some priority in receiving airplanes? I think that's what you asked earlier. Yeah, that part is yes. And, and the answer is yes. Yes. What you told me hasn't been resolved is uh, how we phase in our 2,400 plus planes with what the Brits want and the others. So before we get our final 2,400, the Brits are going to get some along the way. And what I'm hearing you say under oath in this committee is there is no yet agree there's no agreement as to when they start to get their planes. That still has to be resolved. Is that right, Ms. Patrick? That's correct as well. I okay. mean, the, 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 fi the final quantities or intents I mean, of the partner countries have, have not been set yet. No, but have the phase-ins of when they start to get planes been? I mean, this is a digression, but I, I want to clear the record for that. The UK has been determined. General, do you understand? Uh, this isn't a trick question. It's it's. It's what's on the record right now is that there's no agreement, which is a little hard for me to accept, uh, because it would seem to me that there would be some general agreement that, you know, you don't get 2,000 planes before we get 50, if I were the Brits. I would want to make sure that somewhere I was, you know, going to get my planes when I wanted them. Sir, the only, um, the only firm time we have is from the UK which would start in 08, that would be their first procurement of an airplane. So they're, and, and we don't know how many planes, in, in 08 is when we get our planes too. Yes, sir. We, our first delivery is in, in 08. The UK will buy their, procure their first airplanes in 08 with the first delivery in 10. And how many will they get? Nominally 150 total over a certain number of years, and the, the number by and, year and, has and not... And has, has that been determined? I'm not asking what it is. I'm not asking you to tell me what it is, but has that been determined? The number per year in each and every year, no. Okay. That was somewhat a digression, but we seem to be on that topic. I want to I come back to the, to the issue of best value. Tell me what, what we get having the Turks 
Norwegians, the Australians, the Canadians, and, the Den and, and, and Denmark with their 1% participation, what do we get for that? Well, I mean, each case, what we First get. of all, we get a, a financial uh, contribution from uh, those nations to participate in the development phase. Okay. There, and uh, they share in the risks associated with developing the airplane. They're putting money up with no guarantee that uh, the product that comes out the other end is going to be an airplane that's usable. Now, okay. we have high confidence that that's the case. Okay. But since development of you know, high-performance airplanes are risky, what we've asked and what our partners have agreed to do is to share in that risk by putting up costs. I guess if I was in Turkey, I'd want to be able to explain why I invested $150 million into this. Tell me what they tell their constituents. Well, I mean, it, the reason why these countries are interested in investing $150 million or $2 billion into this program is because they will be in a position at some point in the future uh, like us to have a high performance aircraft. Okay. They're, they're also, they also believe okay, that as a reason. Just, just make, it relates to my question, so allow me to do this. But based on the way we are going to develop the plane, there is no promise that they get, a, they get to make any part of the production because their investment does not guarantee them any production. Is that correct for the record? Their investment in the systems design and demonstration program does not guarantee them any portion of the production program. Because we're going to go to the strategic best value sourcing, correct? We're, we have uh, the, the way in which contracts will be awarded for the present phase of the program, systems design I, and yeah, demonstration is on a best value basis. I'm not talking about the contracts. I'm talking about the production. When the, I, I ask the question that their participation in the $150 million does not guarantee them any production contracts. No, it does correct. not. And no, that, it does not. Okay. So the only thing, it seems to me, that they have bought is that if there are 12 countries in line, these 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, Tier 3 come before those who didn't participate at all. I'm not fishing around. I just want well, some logic here. Let, let, me, let, me, let me see whether I can take a shot at this. Um, for all of the countries who have made partnership investments, um, in addition to some of the motivations having to do with spot in, you know, the spot in line for buying airplanes if they decide to do it, their hope is that by learning more about the aircraft, learning more about which contracts are going to be let, being closer, having closer ties to the program office and to the contractor team, their industries will be in a better position to bid effectively on a best value basis. We call it best value, not low cost. Best value, in other words, best technology yep. at you know, the, the, the appropriate cost on components on this yeah. aircraft program. And your example of Turkey was very much to the point in that for a number of the companies, a number of the countries rather, they are having trouble explaining this to their parliamentarians because they have not been sourcing a proportionate return yet on their investment. And so, um, and the fact is, they and that shows that the best value principle is in fact working as advertised. Okay, but, but, but thank you for putting in the record. I mean, it's very logical to me. For 150 million, you, you're in, a, and this is not a bad thing, you're on the inside track. You, you are there as the plane is being uh, um, developed. You begin to know where the needs are. You make contacts. So uh, it, all things being equal, you got a better shot at knowing to say, you know, you can point out to the people, to uh, Lockheed in particular, uh, we, we can make that for you. You can go to your people back home and say, we can do it for you. OK, that makes sense. So uh, I guess the last thing that I would want to do, thank you. I think I should have asked you first. Why did you keep that a secret? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, is there anything else you want to tell me that you? <laughs> well, I, I think I think the other. I mean, since I mean, you, you asked, you know what I've been wrestling with. If you can end my agony here, we could have the hearing end a lot sooner. I'd be delighted to do that, sir. Um, no, but I, but I think it's very important to understand how these contracts have actually worked and how the competitions have yeah, worked. I would like to understand. Because um, it really has worked as a level playing field in that, you know, the, the RFPs go out and 
all bidders bid. Numerous U.S. companies, some foreign companies. Um, and it's not as if there's any direction to a foreign supplier right. or if, you know, there's um, anything other than full and open competition. And as I said earlier, a number of the foreign countries and companies have been very disappointed that they haven't won each time, that um, at the current stage of the program their return is not equal to their investment. Um, but in my office we, we, we studied some of those issues pretty carefully because we wanted to learn those lessons quickly. And um, there were instances where, where companies submitted their bids late, you know, foreign companies. Well, that's a non-compliant bid. There were issues where they bid in terms of um, ship sets instead of units. Um, you know, the, the contracting system is working on a best value basis. So, um, you know, I, I think that... Are you going to have anything to do with the purchase of the presidential helicopter? Because if so, I'd like to put in a good word for Sikorsky. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me, uh, let me uh, end with this, if I could. Um, uh, there are three different numbers now, two different numbers on the record. One I put on the record, which was uh, 1.1, I put in the record 1.1 trillion dollars, the total cost of these planes. Uh, General, you put on the record 3 point, uh, excuse me, 332 million, billion, or 0.332 trillion. And where I'm, I misspoke, because where we got the number, and help me out here, we got the number from the CRS report for Congress, Joint Strike Fighter JSF Program Background Status and Issues, updated June 16, 2003. And in that report, I'll read you this first paragraph, because the number's there, and unless I'm just missing something and, and deserve to be embarrassed here, this is what I'm reading. It's under funding and project costs. The Defense Department's quarterly select acquisition report, SAR, of December 30, 2002, estimated the Joint Strike uh, Fighter program at $1.997 trillion. So they, it wasn't 1.1, they were 1.9. In current year dollars for 2,457 aircraft, which equates to a program unit acquisition cost of $81 billion per aircraft. So am I adding some other number? Are they adding other numbers that I'm not? Or are they just way off the chart? I don't know, sir. I'm going to have to go back and look at that and figure it out. Yeah. I, what, what you said earlier um, about the uh, 332, that was the cost of owning and operating the airplanes over the fleet life. Oh, I'm sorry. Right. It's the, uh, it's one point, it's 195. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. I, g yeah. I gave you 145, and, and the GAO was correct. If you count the four billion that was spent in the... Oh, I understand. But, but if you understand my problem is when I'm looking at a document from the congressional report, and I just read it to you, and we're, we're at this unbelievable number of $1.9 trillion versus your $195 billion, you can understand. I like, I like the Library of Congress. No, so they're way off, or I'm just reading it wrong. So at any rate, that's on the record. We need to clarify. Yes, sir. Okay. I just wanted you to know where staff got our, our information from. Does anybody need to speak to that issue at all? Do you want to yes. say something, Brian? Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, I have a copy of the selected acquisition report that you've referenced right. from your you. report, and I haven't seen the CRS report, yeah. so I don't want to comment on anything they've done, um, but. In the SAR, it says that the total the cost for the quantity you mentioned was 199 billion, like we referenced before. You right, may which have is, got which is your number with the f and it's your number, general, with the four. Okay. Yeah, I think you might have got a decimal, uh, a, a comma, in the wrong place there. Who might? Somebody might have. No, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, not I'm, you. No, I'm, right, I'm they might have. But I haven't seen their report, so I don't yeah. know. Can we? Uh, and if, by the way, if they're doing a report that's so inaccurate, um, I hope they show them to you, and I hope you review them if it needs to be straightened out. Would you get back to us as to the dialogue with the Library of Congress? I, I'll, ask, I'll ask the GAO to do that. Yes. Um, I, I appreciate, uh, Mr. Chairman, the time you've given me. Uh, I think I've asked the questions I've wanted to ask. Do you have others? Uh, no, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I'm assuming at this point um, 
uh, not at this instant, but that we would proceed to adjourn rather than just continue. Right, yeah, no, we definitely adjourn. But if we could do the question that you and I both ask, if I could ask it, um, is there anything that you were prepared to answer that we should have asked you? Is there anything that we should have asked uh, that you didn't want to answer, but I'd still like you to answer it? <laughs> No, bottom line is, I learn a lot from the something that we left out that you put on the record. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, at one of the hearings we had on biological warfare, uh, we were about to adjourn, and one of our witnesses said, well, I just want to tell you what weighs on my mind a lot. He said, and this was a, um, an editor of a major medical magazine, he said, my biggest fear is that a small group of dedicated scientists will create a biological, altered biological agent that will wipe out humanity as we know it. Now, I'm not asking for a showstopper like that, but, but that was important he put on the record. Is there anything that needs to be put on the record? And Ms. Mullins, excuse me, Mr. Mullins and Ms. Uh, Mrs. Shinaski, uh, is there anything that was said that was not the way you view it? Otherwise, I'm going to assume that everything we've learned from DOD uh, has basically been as you see it. Is there anything, any disagreement? I, I don't know about a disagreement, but I would like to to restate what I see as the issue. I'm not sure, sure it's been stated exactly this way. Um, we went into this program with a certain set of assumptions. Um, one of those is that we would have increased interoperability with our allies. You can get interoperability in ways that don't require them to, to have the same kind of equipment we do. That's one. But the other is that there are, um, there are a set of expectations that the partners govern partner governments have here and the partner industries that will continue to push most heavily on Lockheed Martin as the prime supplier. They, they are the ones who have to look at future sales and profitability. Mm -hmm. um, and so the decisions that they make now will, will be geared, you know, obviously toward their continued well-being. Um, and so I would just like to caution that, that there are places where their well-being may, in fact, um, deviate from the, the well-being of the Department of Defense in terms of its own goals and the broader U.S. Um, technology base in terms of what we pay to develop the technologies um, that we provide to the military. And so I would just like to say that, that, that the pressures are going to be on Lockheed Martin and I think it's important, um, even though we were prospective, to continue to look at the decisions that get made in this program to make sure that we stay on track with our original goals. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you my concern. My concern is that uh, in the process of their, of all of us looking at costs, that w conclusions are made that too much of this uh, uh, plane can be made overseas, uh, and that in fact we make too much of it overseas, in spite of the fact that the United States is the major purchaser of it. And you could argue, well, we're getting a cheaper plane, but the problem is we're not getting our men and women making this plane. And I'm not supporting the requirement that 75% of something or 50% has to be U.S. content. But I hope that somehow, General, you have the ability to say, you know, no, this product, this part of the plane is going to be made in the United States. Um, I don't know ultimately. I mean, is it conceivable that, well, I, I, you know, I'm opening up another door, but, but the bottom line is I'm looking at three people looking at me and I'm thinking, what are they thinking? The bottom line to this, is there a danger that too much of this plane will be made overseas if it's based on price and quality, but price? Yes. Well, I, I mean, I uh, will ask Ms. Patrick to address that, but I, one of the things that I would like to say before the hearing closes is that it seems to me that the Joint Strike Fighter is a program that uh, we in the Department of Defense should be proud of and, in fact, are proud of. Right. Uh, I think we've done, and General Hudson has done, uh, a remarkable job of putting together what so far is a highly successful international program. And, and my hope is, is that in the future, more of our major programs are conducted with partners like we're doing on the Joint Strike Fighter Program, where we um, uh, share the, the benefits and share the risks and the costs associated with develop, developing a complex piece of military equipment with partners so that, in fact, they will also have uh, the, cap the military capability uh, that we feel is essential for our allies to have so that they can participate with us as equal partners in military operations around the world. And the final analysis of the Department of Defense is about military capability, and we want our allies to have similar military capabilities to ours so that we can operate effectively with them. 
Uh, I think that our allies are not concerned about uh, having too much of the airplane built overseas. They're concerned that, in fact, uh, they will get a fair, what they consider to be, a fair amount of the aircraft, aircraft in their countries. Uh, and I think that that's really going to be the balancing act. Yeah, but there is some irony. If they never buy the plane, but they get to make a lot of it, uh, it does raise some questions. But I, I do want to agree with Mr. Bokeman. I've had a number of hearings, and I've been much more comfortable with the Joint Strike Fighter uh, program than I have been on a number of other of our defense programs, which I think some have been quite good. So I think so far I, I'm, I have a view that uh, we're doing pretty well. And uh, I do want to thank you, General, and uh, Ms. Patrick as well. Um, I, I think it is a program that is working fairly well. Thank you. I don't, anything, Ms. Patrick? General? Yes, sir. Just a point of a clarification. Three of our uh, eight key performance pa parameters are in this area of supportability. We talked a little bit about that, but that was done up front to have the right emphasis on design such that the airplane would be affordable to own and operate. The production MOUs that we expect to sign, starting with the UK, that's an ongoing process that will take another year to two years before we get all that in place. There was much discussion about that timing, but that's work yet to come. Uh, this will, program has all the potential to give us the advantages we need in coalition warfare with interoperability and other things so that our sons and daughters can fly and fight in this uh, in the future and win successfully. So. Thank you for the additional time, sir. I thought you were going to close by saying that you think it's very important that an American president be flown in an American-built helicopter. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Well, one thing's for certain that um, both for um, the chairman, uh, myself as vice chairman, Mr. Schrock, um, and, and other members of this committee, the committee certainly supports this, this program, regardless of what other individual members so uh, might, might say. The purpose of this hearing is in the, um, the aspect of oversight by this committee. It is not an, uh, a position of opposition to the program. And in that, that process of oversight, what we're looking at is, you know, what are we doing? What are we learning? Are our policies correct? Are our past policy decisions correct? Is there anything that needs to be modified? We know that this is a very uh, difficult program, both technologically, um, the relationships internal to DOD and the joint services and the foreign partnerships, and certainly the financial issues and the staggering numbers of, of uh, the actual costs that we're dealing with, both in research and development and, and ultimately in production. Uh, we appreciate Mr. your participation. Chairman, just one last yes. time. I'm going to save uh, GAO the trouble of verifying with the Library of Congress. They, they've called us, and they said their decimal point was in the wrong place. So therefore, there, it wasn't, you know, 1,997 billion. And they also said, therefore, the 81 is wrong. So to their credit, uh, they're allowing us to say that. It, wrong decimal point. Amazing what it can do. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Excellent. Which, which, which illustrates that as we go through this process. At least someone was of, watching. Yes. As, <laughs> and as we go through this process of oversight, making certain that, that the information that everyone has is correct and that what is occurring is correct, we do know that there are a tremendous amount of, of successes. And we certainly look forward to your success. Uh, with that, we'll be adjourned. Thank you. We continue in a moment with a hearing on transportation issues facing the elderly. Then, a news conference on preventing identity theft online. And today, the Senate will continue work on Homeland Security spending. Live coverage at 9.45 Eastern. The United Nations Security Council meets today on reconstruction efforts in Iraq. UN Secretary General Kofi Annan, the UN Special Representative for Iraq, and a member of the Iraqi National Congress are taking part. That's live starting at 10 a.m. Eastern on C-SPAN 3.